Hi guys, Les Enchi here from the Rift Forums, Enigmius1 on YouTube, here today taking a break from PvP videos to put together a guide covering the basics of PvE tanking. I'll be using my cleric to illustrate key principles, but keep in mind that this information will apply to all callings that come with tanking souls. Sorry mages, I'll make it up to you with the PvP video some other time. To help demonstrate the basics of PvE tanking, I'll be showing footage from Caduceus Rise, which is a level 48 to 50 dungeon. If you're new to Rift or are leveling a new character, don't worry. The information will apply whether you're level 15 or 50. Let's start off with a minor housekeeping detail. Whenever you use the LFG system to find a group, as a tank you'll be assigned leadership. Most healers prefer the raid interface to the normal group interface for dungeons, and as the group leader you're the one who can set this up for them. Press Y to open the raid interface, and then click Convert to Raid. As you can see, this takes the normal party status display and converts it to raid frames, which make it much easier for your healers to see party member hit points and debuffs, and also makes it much easier for them to target players for healing or use mouse over macros. Now let's talk briefly about communication style. Some tanks like to confirm with their party that everyone is ready before they start pulling. If that's the way you like to do things, then that's what you should do. I recommend, however, that if that's what you like to do, that you use the ready check feature. This is done by typing backslash ready check and pressing enter. This brings up the ready check confirmation box for every party member that they can click to confirm they're ready. Simply asking in chat if people are ready is often not enough to get a response from everyone, and then you're standing around waiting for people who aren't paying attention to their chat log. You'll notice I don't do that here because my general assumption is that people are ready when they've moved up to join me after I position myself for the first pull. Speaking of the first pull, let's look at this one. We've got four humanoid mobs lined up and a large stone mob wandering around in the back. As a general rule, mobs that are moving around can be pulled separately from the ones who are standing still. In order to do that, you need to time your pull and position the mobs so that the wandering mobs don't get too close to the other mobs that you're fighting. You'll notice when I pulled this group that the mob I hit with a ranged attack, as well as the one to the far right, came running at me, and the other two mobs have remained where they stood before. Mobs with ranged attacks will only chase you if you move out of their range, or if you move behind an obstacle and force them to change their position if they want to keep attacking you. Moving behind an obstacle is also referred to as moving out of their line of sight, or LOS, and is an important strategy for grouping and positioning mobs as a tank. I want you to take a close look at what is happening here. You can see fireballs flying towards the mob on the left, and the red blue beam as well as arrows flying towards the mob on the right. This is sloppy DPS. In this particular group it's not a huge issue. If you're a lower level and haven't fully filled out your repertoire of tanking abilities, or if this were more demanding content where healer resources were already being pushed to their limits, this could lead to a disastrous situation. As a tank, it's important to be aware of these things. I guarantee you that if you tank long enough, you'll come across the same situation in a group. Because the DPS are splitting their attention between different targets, eventually you will lose control of one of the mobs through no fault of your own, and it will bolt after the DPS. And if the DPS should happen to die because of this, it's not uncommon for them to blame you. It doesn't matter if their friend Bob can tank 20 mobs at the same time without losing threat on any of them. Performing their role properly means targeting and attacking the right mobs. When it comes to trash mobs like this, the right mob to attack is the one the tank is targeting. You'll notice that I blacked out part of the raid frames when I zoomed in on it earlier. My purpose here is not to place blame or try to make anyone look bad. My goal is to try to help illustrate what you're responsible for and what the rest of the group should ideally be doing. Now that that's over with, we're on to the next pull. You'll notice here that after I engage the big rock guy, I move around and turn it to face away from the rest of the party. This is something you should be getting into the habit of doing. There are all kinds of mobs in the game that have some sort of forward-facing AoE attack, and by turning them away from your party, you are reducing the risk of one of your party members getting clobbered. If you have any melee DPS in your group, they will always want to be attacking from the side or from behind the mob, and by turning the mob away from the group, you are making this easier for them. And here's an example of a pull gone bad, and part of that is my fault. My intention with this pull was to get the attention of the mobs by hitting one of them with a ranged attack, and then ducking behind the stone wall, using line of sight to get them all to group up so it would be easier to build threat on them. What I failed to do was announce my intentions to my group. That was my bad. It doesn't make what they did right. If they were paying any attention at all, they would have seen me hit one mob with a ranged attack and then bolt away. No DPS should ever be attacking a mob that isn't being actively tanked unless they know beforehand that the encounter requires it. The end result in this case is that I'm left running around trying to regain control of the situation. 
a more demanding content like an expert dungeon, that would be one dead DPS. And they'd probably blame me for that too. We've got a boss here just off screen to my right, but because I've run this dungeon before I know that the stone guy off in the distance will patrol close enough to go after our party while we're in the middle of the boss fight, so I'm going to ride ahead and grab him and take care of him before we engage the boss. You'll notice here that I don't stop to ask the party if they're ready. This particular boss doesn't do anything particularly surprising, or so I thought as I pulled him. Once again, you can see I move in and turn the boss to face away from my group. Is it necessary for this fight? I have no idea. It's just a habit. The only time it would be a bad habit is if the boss had some sort of tail whip like a dragon or something. This guy doesn't even have a tail. I think I'm safe. Okay, so as we can see, the boss is putting stuff on the ground. In the overwhelming majority of cases, if a boss causes something to appear on the ground, you don't want to stand in it. This is PvE 101. Don't stand in the shit that kills you. As a DPS or a healer, your only thought is usually just moving out of it while staying in range of the boss you need to kill or the party members you need to heal. As a tank, you also need to give some thought to making sure that your melee DPS still have a safe place to stand and attack the mob. You'll see here that I leave a spot to the side of the mob out of habit. We don't have a melee DPS in the group, but if we did, I'm sure he'd appreciate my thoughtful approach to tanking. It only took a near wipe and a combat rezzed rogue to convince my party members that standing in ground based AoE is a bad idea, and we finished this boss without further difficulty. Once again you'll notice I don't stop and ask my party if they're ready. If my healer is short on mana, I leave it to them to let me know as I head off to the next pull. If my DPS are short on mana or health, they can drink and catch up when they're ready. Now this is a much better example of a clean LOS pull. I hit one mob with a ranged attack and duck behind a wall, and shortly after they all come running around the corner where it's much easier to land AoE attacks on all of them and keep them neatly contained. This dungeon in particular seems to have been designed to make the pulls a little more tricky than you might find in other dungeons. The mobs are spread out just enough that normal AoE threat builders won't reach them all where they stand. As long as you understand the basics of how to group mobs together, it doesn't really matter how far apart they are. Just use the tricks you know, have faith in your party that they'll be patient while you get everything together, and then carry on as per usual. And just like that we're at the second boss. This guy does nothing all that dangerous or special, once again you'll see I turn him away from the rest of the group, and again, no reason, just have it. While we kill him and advance through some of the trash, I'll take this opportunity to talk about another important consideration as a tank, and that's pacing. Because you're the one who initiates each fight, you're the one who sets the pace. If you're new to tanking, you might not be fully confident in what you're doing, and that will tend to slow you down a bit. That's fine. Do the best you can with what you've got, and the confidence will come in time. I occasionally see posts on the forums from people who resent tanks and other players that just rush, rush, rush through everything. Everyone is entitled to their opinion, even when they're wrong. But let me just share my point of view as a tank. I've run this dungeon many times gearing my different characters for warfronts in the 40 to 49 bracket. I've seen it, it's nothing new to me, and you will encounter many players who will be in the same boat. They're in the dungeon because they're trying to get a daily done, or they're farming rep, or they're trying to get a particular upgrade to drop from a boss. I'm not saying you shouldn't be friendly or social, I'm just pointing out that it's important to remember that everyone has their own reasons for running the content, and if you're the one setting the pace, it's usually a good idea to try to keep things moving in a forward direction. With this trash pull you'll notice I just ran up and hit the stone guy with a ranged attack and the other four mobs near him also came running. Once again I used the wall to LOS them and make it easier to group them up, but this brings us to another point. If I had waited long enough, the big stone guy would have moved away and I could have pulled them separately. Despite anything else that may or may not have gone wrong in this group, the healing I've been receiving has been fully adequate and I was confident that I could manage all of these mobs together without dying. In this case, everything worked out fine, but let's pretend for a moment that I had died and the group wiped as a result. It doesn't matter what I think the healer should have been capable of. I made a decision to pull more mobs than I needed to. If you take the risk, you also take the responsibility. And this goes both ways. If your group is pressuring you to pull more mobs than you're comfortable with, then pull what you're comfortable with. 
it's good to cooperate with your group and be a little flexible and it's good to push the limit sometimes so that you can learn and grow as a tank but at the end of the day the decision is yours. Alright, enough with the dungeon stuff for a minute, let's take a break from all that and go over some movement fundamentals. I mentioned earlier that a tank's job is containing and positioning the mobs that are attacking your group. In order to assist you in that, I want to take a moment to discuss mobility. As a tank, you want to avoid having mobs attack you from behind. This allows them to bypass your block and parry, which ultimately increases the amount of damage you're taking. At the same time, there are all kinds of situations where you need to be on the move in a fight. Let's pretend these three target dummies are the mobs we're fighting. You could turn and run, but this brings us back to being attacked from behind. You could walk backwards as shown here, but as you can see, this is very slow. In order to keep the mobs in front of you and retain your movement speed, you want to make sure you're familiar with how to strafe. If you need to move backwards, you can turn to the left or right and strafe out. This keeps mobs from attacking you from behind without restricting your movement speed. You want to turn almost 90 degrees. Turn too far and mobs are at your back. As you can see, you can only run so far before things start to get a little wonky, and the solution to this if you need to move backwards is to do a bit of a zigzag. Turn almost 90 degrees and strafe out, then turn 180 degrees the opposite way and strafe. Repeat as necessary until you've positioned yourself where you need to be. Be aware that the strafing animation might make it look like you have your back to the mobs. This is just the animation. As long as you haven't turned more than 90 degrees, the mobs will be considered as being at your side for calculating whether or not you can block or parry. Okay, we're nearing the end. I've skipped some trash in a boss fight because there wasn't much to talk about from a tanking point of view, but this last boss encounter brings us to another element of tanking. I didn't explain this boss fight to the party before we started. Based on previous boss fights, I probably should have, so I'll take partial responsibility for anything that happens. This particular boss has two phases. The first phase, which you see here, doesn't require anything special from a tank point of view. The start of the second phase is indicated when the boss leaps away. At this point, a number of adds will spawn. There are four small stone monster adds and four yellow orb adds. None of these mobs have a lot of hit points, but if you leave the little stone guys alone, they're going to go after your healer and that's never ideal. The yellow orbs can't really be tanked. They're too spread out to round them up effectively. They float around and fire ranged attacks at anyone in range. As long as the little stone guys are alive, the boss just stands off to the side doing a whole lot of nothing. There's no point trying to tank him because he's not a threat. As soon as the little stone guys are dead, the boss comes back and resumes his first phase behavior. If there are any yellow orbs remaining, they will continue to float around lobbing ranged attacks, and this can become taxing for your healer. Experienced DPS would know that when you see adds, you should probably shift your attention to them and burn them down. The DPS in this group didn't pick up on that, and it wasn't until someone pointed out to them in chat to kill them that they finally got around to doing it. By that time, two full waves of them were floating around causing problems. If anyone had died as a result of this, guess who would have got blamed? Okay, now look. Throughout this guide, it might seem like I've been harping on the DPS like there's some kind of failures while I'm infallible because I'm the tank. Let's just be clear. For any given trash pull, there are usually several different ways that you can tank it effectively. Experienced tanks watching this guide would probably find several encounters where they would have done things differently than what I did. If your group survives the encounter with no wipes or deaths, the group as a whole did okay. This isn't demanding content that I'm running. In more demanding content, I already know our group would have wiped numerous times, and I would have been partially at fault for at least some of those wipes. The point I'm trying to get at here is that new tanks are often put off from tanking because they get blamed for anything that goes wrong. The only time someone else gets blamed is if a DPS dies to something stupid like standing in shit that kills them, in which case they'll typically blame the healer instead of you. Most players are great folks to group with. Every once in a while you'll come across that guy who just isn't very good and who contributes to all kinds of problems but is very quick to blame anyone else they think they can. Part of learning to tank and enjoying tanking is learning what is and isn't your responsibility. You can try to help newer players learn their roles, but if they can't or won't learn, that's not your fault. Focus on your responsibility, do what you can to be helpful, and ignore the guys who rage at you because they don't realize how awful they are. That's it for this guide. I hope that it was helpful. Feel free to leave any comments below, have fun, and subscribe to my channel. Cheers, guys.